Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm Linda of Linda Herman's Photography, and this is where we talk about all things related to food photography. And today we are going to be talking about how to do food photography on a budget. So I've decided to split this video into three small parts. The first is to look at how and where you can source affordable camera gear and lenses. Secondly, I'm going to talk through how to shop for affordable props and backdrops. And lastly, I'm going to share with you some cheap or free learning resources that will help you continue along your food photography journey. So I hope that all these things are gonna come in really helpful for you today. I also just want to quickly start off with sharing a little bit of my journey very early on just so you can understand what it is that I also went through and how it is definitely possible to do food photography without that much stuff. So back in 2020 when the pandemic hit is the year that I really started practicing and honing in on my food photography. Before that I had been traveling, I was backpacking on the road and I knew that I wanted to do food photography. So I would literally just pick up my camera occasionally and just practice with whatever food was in front of me, whether I was in a restaurant, whether I was in a volunteering place and I was just capturing the food that we cooked at home. Anything like that was what I did to just get a feel for food photography and what it is that I needed to improve on basically. I had a second hand Canon camera and a vintage 50 millimeter lens which didn't have autofocus. It looked a little bit like this one here so it's quite old um, and yeah no autofocus. I didn't have a tripod and so I was really just learning how to use the lens, how to function my camera and just get a feel for what kind of angles and positions I wanted to be on to shoot food. When the pandemic hit, I was actually living in Argentina with Caleb, my partner, and his mum. We were staying in her apartment and I knew that at some point I was going to be going back to the UK. So I didn't really want to go out and buy, not that I could really go out, but I didn't want to go out and buy much stuff to fill up or clutter up my mother-in-law's house. So I was limited to what I could find in her apartment to shoot with. So that meant that I had the floor or a really big ceramic kitchen tile left over from her kitchen refurb um, to shoot on as my backdrop, which was kind of a neutral gray color. So that's what you will see if you scroll back on my Instagram feed. That is the color that you will see for several months and near the beginning of my journey, just this gray backdrop. And I was using the plates and cutlery and props that I could find in her apartment as well. So whilst they weren't really my style, it was enabling me to just practice with what I had and I could really focus on practicing composition and color and storytelling in those first few months. So if you have nothing except a camera, you can still get started. <laughs> you just need to find a surface to shoot on. We're going to talk about props and backdrops a bit later on, but if you can find any surface to shoot on, you can get started without any equipment except your camera. Now, when you are ready to invest in more camera gear, some places that you can look for affordable gear are on secondhand websites. So buying secondhand is a fantastic way of saving your money, spending a bit less, but still getting a very good quality camera. And one of the reasons that I really recommend this, especially for beginners, is because at the entry level, at the beginner level, you don't need the latest, most expensive, most fancy camera to practice and improve your food photography. An entry level camera from a few years ago will be absolutely perfect and will be much, much cheaper, especially on a secondhand website or even buying one from a friend or someone that you know who is selling one. So definitely try having a look at secondhand websites or marketplaces where you can can find a second-hand camera and the same applies to lenses. One thing that I will say when you are shopping for a second-hand camera is to check the shutter count on the camera. How many photos has it taken before you're buying it? Because cameras have like a maximum lifespan of how many photos they can take before they're really going to start to degrade. And of course you don't want a camera that has taken thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and will not last very long after you've bought it. So most cameras are said to have a shutter count of about 200,000 clicks. And when you're looking for a second-hand camera, most people are trying to look for one that has had about 50 or 60,000 shutter clicks. So you still have plenty more in that camera ready for you to use. 
My first camera, my first DSLR camera was a second hand camera. I had a Fuji film that I bought from a website which still exists and is also very common and very well recommended, which is MPB Photographic. I'll link that in the description box below. So MPB Photographic is a very good second hand website that I really recommend for finding any pre-loved or second hand cameras and lenses. Another way that's great for saving money when it comes to investing or upgrading your camera equipment is that before you buy, you can actually rent lenses to test them out beforehand. And this is really great if you are unsure about what camera or what lens you want to buy next. A camera or a lens can be a really big investment and of course nobody wants to buy something and then when it arrives have a play with it and realize that maybe it's not the right one and it, you don't like it, it doesn't work well for you, there's just something that doesn't vibe well for you. So one of the ways to avoid that is to contact a local camera gear rental shop and actually rent your lens or your desired camera for a few days or even a week have a play with it, really figure it out, see if you like it. And if you do, then make that investment and that will prevent you spending any money and then having to change or resell your camera to get another one just a few months later. The last thing I want to say about lenses is that you can also look for third party lenses to fit your camera. So the main manufacturers like Nikon and Canon and Sony, their own lenses are often quite expensive, but we can find slightly cheaper ones by buying a third party lens. This is simply a lens that has been made or manufactured by a different manufacturer than the model of your camera or the make of your camera. So Samyang, Tamron and Sigma are a bunch of well-known third-party lens manufacturers and those will typically mount onto other manufacturers of cameras such as Nikon and Sony and Canon and may well be cheaper than lenses from those manufacturers. So it's worth checking those out and just comparing the equivalent prices of the lens that you're looking to buy. Okay, so moving on to props and backdrops. And I think I speak for almost all food photographers when I say that props and backdrops are our ultimate favorite thing to buy. And we could easily go out and just fill our entire homes with props and backdrops, but we have to restrain ourselves. So you're probably in the same situation, or if you're not already, you will be soon. And so I wanted to give some tips on where to source or how to spend less money when buying props and backdrops for yourself. So my number one favorite place to shop for props in particular is an antique markets or antique shops and flea markets. These are fantastic places for finding little knickknacks, just old things that people don't want anymore. And you can often pick things up for next to nothing. I have an antique store just down the road. It has a selection of things that are more expensive, things that are cheaper. But for example, I have been able to find some really gorgeous cutlery in different kinds of metals. They're often matte. Um, not shiny because they're old. Uh, these ones are often 20p a piece, which is amazing. I've also found cute little things like these little trays and old pages, old papers, um, and also just random little things that I might need for a particular project shoot. So flea markets and antique stores are definitely a great place to look. Or even charity shops. In the UK we have charity shops where we can go and donate unwanted things and then a particular charity will have a shop where they can resell those things and the money goes to that charity. So this is also a really great place to find second-hand and pre-loved items items that will work really well for food photography. If you don't have things like antique markets or these charity shops near you, then some of the high street stores will also have some really beautiful glassware, beautiful plates and crockery, places like Zara Home, H&M Home, TK Maxx. TK Maxx is one of my all time favorites. Um, these places are really, really good for finding more current, more modern, new items like plates and glassware. One thing I will say though is to don't not go overboard and buy a whole set of crockery. We don't need like a four or six piece plate and bowl set. I would, where you can, just buy one or two of your favorite plates and bowls. Usually the smaller size ones are also better because the large ones can look a bit strange in food photography. They look really oversized and just a bit ugly. So just picking one or two maximum three of any item that you like means that you never 
have, well, in the beginning, you shouldn't have too much stuff, but just enough to kind of mix and match plates and still create scenes that show that there are two or three people maybe enjoying a meal together. Or you can, of course, just mix and match things and, and put as many plates down as you want and create that really nice mismatching feel. One of my little tricks for bottles also is to simply clean bottles that I have bought that had maybe pre-made cocktails inside. For example, um, this lovely bottle has some nice texture on the front here and a gold lid. Um, and this is actually from a supermarket that had a pre-made cocktail inside it. I just took off the label and now I can use this as a really cute little bottle in my images. I do the same with this little one here and also some dessert pots in the supermarket come in these glass bowls which are really helpful for putting things like fruit in or nuts and seeds or just poking in the side of your frame. So look out for these sorts of things in supermarkets, enjoy eating it and then you can also wash it and enjoy using it for your food photography as well. A little mindset thing that you could try applying if you feel that you find it difficult to not buy too much is to start using a one in one out policy when you buy new props for your collection. So a friend of mine did this and it worked really, really well for her. So she would go into antique shops or charity shops and she would always return something to be able to buy something new. And this meant that she was spending less money because she tended to be shopping in these kind of cheaper places like thrift stores and charity shops. She was also cleaning out her, um, her prop collection and only replacing it with new things. But it also meant that she had a really nice turnaround of equipment. So she kind of had a constant change in what she was shooting with and it kept all her work looking really fresh and really different, which is really cool. And of course you can just keep any of the pieces that you like the most and you're just getting rid of the bits that you're not using so much. That's a really good technique to apply if you struggle to not buy everything you see. The last thing I wanna say about props is also to borrow from family and friends. As you know, when I was in Argentina, I was just using what was available to me, so my mother-in-law's apartment. But even here, I am still going around my family's homes and borrowing things from them as and when I need them. My sister has some really amazing little black espresso cups, which are really cool. Um, I've also exchanged some items with some friends. So I got these really cool pieces of cutlery from somebody who moved away. And it's just a really nice way of using things that you already own or your family already owns. Maybe your grandmother has the most amazing vintage tea set, which actually I have one up in the cupboard here as well. And they just can create some really beautiful stories that mean something to you as well. So I definitely recommend borrowing from family and friends, it means you don't spend any money and you can create some really cute stories with them as well. When it comes to backdrops, again, it's another place that we can spend a lot of money uh, on the backdrop shops, but there are also some ways that you can avoid spending too much money aside from just shopping on their deals where they have three for two or something like this. Um, just look around your house and shoot on any surfaces that you like the look of. I have taken pictures on my kitchen floor, on my wooden table, in my dining room. Many different things work as backdrops. You can grab some tablecloths that you might have and put them down. They create a really nice kind of bistro, restaurant type feeling, which can be really nice. You can take some papers, some newspapers or some trays, anything that you might cook or bake on as your surface or backdrop as well. So do look around first and try to be creative with what you have in your home to create your surfaces before investing in backdrops. Backdrops are wonderful things. I do also have a collection and I feel Feel like I want to buy so many more um, but I do have to collect myself and I also do the same thing at home We're using tablecloths or my wooden table for some variation without having to spend more money on backdrops. <laughs> In the last part of this video, I want to talk about cheap and free learning resources to help you continue to build and improve your food photography. And if you are looking to accelerate your learning and grow your skills and start building an amazing portfolio, then I would love to point you in the direction of my brand new online food photography course, which is called Hobbyist to Pro.
It is designed for beginners in food photography and it gives you a full end-to-end -end understanding building all the foundations of food photography from mastering your camera on manual mode, understanding natural light, we talk about colour theory, composition, storytelling and planning your photo shoots, all the way through to how to edit your images in different styles, importing and exporting into editing software like Lightroom and even building an efficient workflow. So Hobbyist to Pro at the moment is $24.99. It also comes with my ebook, 101 Food Styling Tips. So if that sounds like something that you'd love to take a look at, I will leave the link in my description box below. So go and check that out. It's a really affordable and great way to be learning food photography in your own time at home. So do go and check that out. Some other platforms that offer great courses in food photography are things like Domestica and Skillshare. So these are platforms that offer courses from other creatives, other photographers, other experts and professionals in our industry. And they're also really affordable courses on these websites as well. So do go and check those out. Some other really great resources for learning and practicing your food photography come in the form of books. Some of the most talented food photographers in our niche have actually written and published books that we can learn from, which is incredible. So I have a few of them here. We've got Kimberly Espinel's Creative Food Photography. We've got Joni Simon's Picture Perfect Food. And we've also got Bia Lubis's How to Photograph Food. And I also believe that Lauren Karish Short has also published a book recently. So I will link to all of those in the description box below. I love having books available to me because they are really great to flick through on a weekly basis in the evening, maybe before you go to bed or whenever you're planning a new creative project. They're just full of inspiration and tips and guidelines. And they can be really nice to have open while you're shooting as well to refer back to. So I do definitely recommend picking up one of these books or a couple of them and having them available to you whenever you just need some inspiration and some guidance. I would also recommend looking at plenty of other food photographers online because many of them also offer a free newsletter like I do and they share free tips about food photography and business tips as well through their free newsletter content which is a really amazing way to be learning all the way through the year for free with people who have so much knowledge and experience that they are just ready to share with you. So have a look on Instagram, see who your favourite photographers are and see if they have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. If you'd like to subscribe to mine, again, I will leave the link in the description box. I send weekly newsletters and each month we talk about a different food photography topic. And I also send a monthly roundup at the end of each month in case you missed anything, as well as a monthly creative inspiration email sharing different things around that I found that have been helping me creatively and building my mindset a little bit more positively. So if you're interested in receiving those emails for free, then do sign up to my mailing list. And you also get 10% off my online shop when you're subscribed, which means you get 10% off my online course and all the eBooks available there as well. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've learned some new things today. Uh, if you like the video, please do give me a thumbs up. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, do leave them in the comments box below. I read all of them. I respond to all of them. I love to hear from you. So please don't be shy and do that. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any upcoming videos. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.